Last time we looked at chapter 3, and Lewis was continuing his discussion. He was presenting us an argument against naturalism from reason. Okay? There are lots of different arguments against naturalism. We looked at a few. First, it might be good to familiarize ourselves again with these definitions. Naturalism is the view that nature is all that exists and that everything that happens can be explained in natural terms. So there are no gods, angels, demons, devils, whatever. Everything is just a part or a product of nature. So think about things that are natural. Trees, rocks, stars, animals. The naturalist is going to say these are all just natural things. A god didn't create people. Animals emerge. Species emerge from evolution. All that stuff. And so the naturalist is going to say, or at least imply, most of them, if they follow the contemporary scientific view, that all of this stuff is made of matter and it can be explained in those terms. We can explain what happens in your mind by talking about neurotransmitters and neurons and biological, chemical, and physical processes. This view, Lewis is contrasting with supernaturalism. That's basic, basically the view that nature is not all that exists. There's at least one other thing, or perhaps many other things. They can't be just explained in natural terms. Perhaps you believe a god exists, or angels, or ghosts, or things that are just not the products of evolution in the Big Bang, something like that. Remember, what Lewis is trying to do in this book is he's trying to provide a case that miracles are possible. And then he's going to argue that miracles have actually occurred in human history. We're not going to get there. What we're interested in are these metaphysical and epistemological arguments. So what was Lewis trying to get at? Well, he presented one argument against naturalism from reason. We looked at Alvin Plantinga's argument of the evolutionary argument against naturalism. If we think evolution is true, that should lead us to think that we don't have any good reason to believe in naturalism. And we also looked at some other arguments, although we didn't make it explicit, about how it would seem that the contemporary scientific view undermines itself in certain ways. So how did we characterize that view? Well, what I called the contemporary scientific view is naturalistic, materialistic, and evolutionary. What does that mean? Well. The contemporary scientific view states everything is just a part of nature. Furthermore, all that stuff is just matter, fundamentally. That's the thing that makes up everything. And the origins and development of life, of organisms, can be explained in evolutionary terms. The theory of evolution, that stuff. This is what a lot of people believe, right? This is what a lot of scientists believe, a lot of prominent intellectuals. But what the thinkers that we looked at last time were trying to argue was that if you hold this view, there are a bunch of reasons why you don't have any good reason to hold this view. Lewis, Greg Bonson, Alvin Plantinga, and other thinkers have argued that if this view is true, that would imply there's no free will. Why? 
Well, you're just doing what you do because of the chemical and biological reactions and processes in your body and brain and the biological and chemical and physical processes out there. So, the cause of your emotions, your thoughts, your actions is just matter following the natural laws of the universe. That would seem to imply you don't really have a choice over what you do. You don't have a free will. Your will is determined by these things. Do you have any control over what the laws of nature are? No. Do you have any control over whether or not your brain right now is producing a certain chemical reaction? No. Consequently, Lewis tried to argue that if this view is true, the contemporary scientific view, how we reason is utterly different than how we think about it and what we think it is. The way that we approach arguments and debates and conversations now is we have this idea that I can look at the evidence I can weigh the evidence, I can, you know, trace the logic through an argument, and on the basis of all that stuff, I make up my mind about what's reasonable or unreasonable. I make up my mind of, you know, what to believe in some sense, or what to follow. But that picture is entirely contradicted by this contemporary scientific view. What would reasoning be on that view? Just the result of what? Chemical reactions in your brain. Consequently, why should we assume that chemical reactions in our brain have anything to do with what we think is sound or valid or reasonable or justified? And how can we think that we have any ability or choice in weighing evidence, in freely reaching a conclusion? We wouldn't, Lewis argues. Reason as we understand it would be this completely different thing. As Bonson put it, our reasoning process would basically be the same type of thing as a weed growing in a field. Because all these things are just, you know, natural, material things. Thus, this view seems to imply all the knowledge we think we have about the world, our beliefs, our thoughts, are just caused by physical forces and processes. And that they're products of evolution, right? The theory of evolution is going to say the reason you have the traits and characteristics that you do is because you have certain genes and mutations that were selected for on the basis of reproductive fitness and survivability. Thus, the way that you think, the way that you see the world, your genes, all of that stuff is adapted for survival on this planet. Not necessarily apprehending truth. And so Lewis and other thinkers think these, this view implies some very strange things about the view in question. Lewis and Plantinga and Bonson and other thinkers are going to argue if the contemporary scientific view is true and we can explain everything in natural terms, everything is made of matter, we're just determined to have the thoughts and beliefs that we have, we don't have any reason to think we know that the view is true or that it's reasonable. 
Why? How come we don't have any good reason to think that it's true? Or that we could know that it's true, according to Lewis? Yeah. Why does Lewis say this? If the contemporary scientific view is true, why does he say, you don't have any good reason to believe that? And that's not something you could know. Yeah. Because you're just a configuration of atoms and so are your thoughts. Yeah. You're just determined to have the thoughts and beliefs that you do. You didn't make a choice about what you think is true. Evolution and your brain processes are just making you have certain thoughts and beliefs. So why would you think they're reasonable? Why would you think you have knowledge of how the world works? If you're just determined to have certain thoughts and beliefs and ideas about things. Right, exactly. So, in a weird way, if this view is true, if the contemporary scientific view is true, that would seem to undermine this idea that we can prove it, this idea that we can know it, this idea that we have good reason to believe it. Why? Because we didn't, we didn't make a choice and weigh the evidence freely and decide on the basis of reason and rationality what seems right. Your thoughts and your beliefs are just things that your brain is making you have. And they're products of your evolutionary history. And so in a weird way, if we assume that evolution is true, let's assume it for now, in a weird way, that means that the way your brain works is adapted to survival. Is that necessarily connected to knowing what's true? No, oh, these are two different things, right? So if evolution is true, the implication is, how could you know it? In fact, it would seem to have, uh, there would seem to be good reason for you to think that you have a very limited knowledge, if any. Because, again, you're de just determined to have these thoughts and beliefs. And you're geared, you're oriented towards the world in a way that is going to help you reproduce and survive, not necessarily figure out how it works. So, if the view is true, it does not seem that we could freely conclude or prove or show that. And it would seem that much of our knowledge has become doubtful. So that's basically what I was trying to present to you last time. And I know it was difficult and confusing, but it's a very interesting argument. Does this make sense? I'm not telling you what to believe here. I'm just trying to express what Lewis and other thinkers have been arguing. Okay, so what we're going to do then today is we're going to look at chapter 4 and hopefully chapter 5. See what Lewis says here. So everybody, please pull up the reading on your laptop. I'm not going to do all the reading today. I'm going to make you all read. So would somebody volunteer? And if not, I'm just going to choose one of you. Okay, start at chapter 4, please, when you have it pulled up. You can start with the quote at the top. Unless it's not there in the edition that I <laughs> uploaded on. Throughout the long tradition of, of European thought, it has been said not by everyone, but by most people, 
or at any rate by most of those who have proved that they have a right to be heard, that nature, though it is a thing that really exists, is not a thing that exists in itself or in its own right, but a thing which depends for, depends for its existence upon something else. Okay, stop there. What is Collingwood saying there? What have some people said about nature, about our reality? Ah, th that's the point right there, yeah. Some people have argued, indeed, Lewis is going to argue, a lot of Christians and other religious people are going to argue. Something is responsible for why all this is here and how it is. It doesn't seem to be just an accident. It depends, its existence depends on something else. Okay. If our argument has been sound, rational thought or reason is not interlocked with the greater interlocking system of the rational events which we call nature. I am not maintaining that consciousness as a whole must be necessarily be put in the same position. Pleasures, pains, fears, hopes, affections, and mental images need not. No absurdity would follow from regarding them as parts of nature. The distinction we have to make is not one between mind and matter, much less between soul and body, hard words, all four of them, but between reason and nature, the frontier coming not where the outer world ends and what I should ordinarily call myself begins, but, begin, but between reason and the whole mass of irrational events, whether yeah, physical or psychological. Good, good. Yeah, so again, the whole point of this chapter three Lewis was trying to make the case that because we conclude naturalism is true or that these other views are true on the basis of reason, that is our starting point. Reason seems to have a special character. It doesn't seem to be the same kind of thing as just you reacting to a hot stove by pulling your hand off of it. It doesn't seem to be the same kind of thing as a fear that you feel when you're walking in downtown Pittsburgh at night. It seems to be something else. Okay, I'll pick it up now. I'll do a little bit. At that frontier, we find a great deal of traffic, but it is all one-way traffic. It is a matter of daily experience that rational thoughts induce and enable us to alter the course of nature. Of physical nature, when we use mathematics to build bridges, or of psychological nature, when we apply arguments to alter our own emotions. We succeed in modifying physical nature more often and more completely than we succeed in modifying psychological nature, but we do at least a little to both. On the other hand, nature is quite powerless to produce rational thought. Not that she never modifies our thinking, but that the moment she does so, it ceases for that very reason to be rational. For, as we have seen, a train of thought loses all rational credentials as soon as it can be shown to be wholly the result of non-rational causes. Okay, so you remember this point from last time? He made a distinction between being caused to have a belief and rationally arriving at a belief, right? I use the example of if I put a microchip in your brain and I pressed a button and I caused you to believe that I'm the best, I then asked you, do you have good reason to believe that? And what did you all say? No. no, why not? Right. It's not something you arrived at. It's something that I induced in you, like through electro, electrical impulse or something. Right? And so when we talk about arguments, when we talk about logic and reason, when we say that somebody 
has been caused to have a certain belief by their hormones or by brain processes or anything else, we think that they don't have good reason to believe that thing or it's not logical or it's not rational. That is the intuition that we have. When nature, so to speak, attempts to do things to rational thoughts, she only succeeds in killing them. That is the peculiar state of affairs at the frontier. Nature can only raid reason to kill, but reason can invade nature to take prisoners and even to colonize. Every object you see before you at this moment, the walls, the ceiling, the furniture, the books, your own washed hands and cut fingernails, bear witness to the colonization of nature by reason. For none of this would matter. None, for none of this matter would have been in these states if nature had her way. And if you are attending to my argument as closely as I hope, that attention also results from habits which reason has imposed on the natural ramblings of your consciousness. If, on the other hand, a toothache or an anxiety is at this very moment preventing you from attending, then nature is indeed interfering with your consciousness. But not to produce some new variety of reasoning, only, as far as in her lies, to suspend reason altogether. Okay, Nevelyn, will you pick it up? Yep. In other words, the relation between reason and nature is what some people call an unsymmetrical relation. Brotherhood is a symmetrical relation because if A is a brother of B, B is a brother of A. Father and son is a unsymmetrical relation because if A is the father of B, B is not the father of A. The relation between reason and nature is of this kind. Reason is not related to nature as nature is related to reason. Good. Yeah, keep going. I am only too well aware how shocking those who have been brought up to naturalism will find the picture which begins to show itself. It is, frankly, a picture in which nature, at any rate on the surface of your own planet, is perforated or uh, pockmarked all over by little orifices, at each of which something of a different kind from herself, namely a reason, can do things to her. Right. Yeah, just stop there for a second. So this is, what he's presenting here is a picture that we take for granted, but we don't really think about. Would there be computers, buildings, uh, PowerPoints, technology, if nature had her way? No, how did all those things get here? Right. We have some sort of ability to employ our faculties and manipulate the world around us. Right? We can dig a hole. We can cut down a tree. We can build a bridge. We can create technology. So what Lewis is going to say here is, again, there's an asymmetrical relation between human beings and nature in some sense, or reason and physical processes. And he says, I can only beg you, before you throw the book away, to consider seriously whether your instinctive repugnance to such a conception is really rational, or whether it is only emotional or aesthetic. I know that the hankering for a universe, which is all of a piece, and in which everything is the same sort of thing as everything else, a continuity, a seamless web, a democratic universe, is very deep-seated in the modern heart, in mine no less than yours. But have we any real assurance that things are like that? Are we mistaking for an intrinsic probability what is really a human desire for tidiness and harmony? Bacon warned us long ago, Francis Bacon, that, 
Quote, the human understanding is of its own nature prone to suppose the existence of more order and regularity in the world than it finds. And though there may be many things which are singular and unmatched, yet it devises for them parallels and conjugates and relatives which do not exist. Hence the fiction that all celestial bodies move in perfect circles. This used to be how humans thought, right? The planets were moving in perfect circles. No, we learned that those orbits are elliptical, right? More like ovals. I think Bacon was right. Science itself has already made reality appear less homogeneous than we expected it to be. Newtonian atomism was much more the sort of thing we expected and desired than quantum physics. Okay. Will somebody else pick it up now? Go for it. If you can, even for the moment, endure the suggested picture of nature. Let us now consider the other factor, the reasons for the instances of reason which attack her. We have seen that rational thought is not part of the system of nature. Within each man, there must be an area, however small, of activity which is outside or independent of her. In relation to nature, rational thought goes on of its own accord or exists on its own. It does not follow follow that rational thought exists absolutely on its own. It might be independent of nature by being dependent on something else. For it is not dependence simply, but dependence on irrational, which undermines the credentials of thought. One step in an argument depends on the previous step and is all, but is all the better for doing so. One man's reason has been led to see things by the aid of another man's reason, and is none the worse for that. It is thus still an open question whether each man's reason exists absolutely on its own, or whether it is the result of some rational cause, in fact, of some other reason. That other reason might conceivably be found to depend on a third, and so on. It would not matter how far this process was carried, provided he found reason coming from reason at each stage. It is only when you are asked to believe in reason coming from non-reason that you must cry halt, for if you don't, all thought is discredited. It is therefore obvious that sooner or later you must admit a reason which exists absolutely on its own. The problem is whether you or I can believe in such a self-existent reason. Ah, okay. So, you did a good job. So, he's presenting a very strange picture to us, right? What is that picture? It would seem that... Part of our minds or our being is not determined by the laws of nature, by physics, by chemistry. What do you all think of that idea? Is that crazy? Yeah. I don't know what to think about it because isn't that what this whole text is kind of about? Miracles, like some intervention other than what we usually see. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the implication he's going to arrive at is, yeah, maybe it would seem that reason intervenes in nature in a way that is not explicable by nature. Yeah. Is that ridiculous? I guess it would depend on how you think all this stuff got here, right? And what it is. Certainly if God does exist, God could create us with a free will, right? But if you don't believe God exists, maybe you think everything he's saying is nonsense, right? So let's see where he takes this, okay? I'll reread that last sentence, the last few. 
It is therefore obvious that sooner or later you must admit a reason which exists absolutely on its own. The problem is whether you or I can be such a self-existent reason. This question almost answers itself the moment we remember what existence on one's own means. It means that kind of existence which naturalists attribute to the whole show and which supernaturalists attribute to God. For instance, what exists on its own must have existed from all eternity. For if anything else could make it begin to exist, then it would not exist on its own, but because of something else. It must also exist incessantly. That is, it cannot cease to exist and then begin again. For having once ceased to be, it obviously could not bring itself back into existence. And if anything else were called it, it would then be a dependent being. Now it is clear that my reason has grown up gradually since my birth and is interrupted for several hours each night. What's he talking about? Sleep. Sleep, yeah. I therefore cannot be that eternal self-existent reason which neither slumbers nor sleeps. Yet, if any thought is valid, such a reason must exist and must be the source of my own imperfect and intermittent rationality. Human minds, then, are not the only supernatural entities that exist. They do not come from nowhere. Each has come into nature from supernature. Each has its taproot in the eternal, self-existent, rational being whom we will call God. Each is an offshoot or spearhead or incursion of that supernatural entity into nature. Okay, so what is he implying here? If we can reason at all, if that's a thing that happens like we think it does, where does it come from? Famous three-letter word. God. What do you all think of that idea? Is your reason telling you that that is unlikely? Yeah. Would that mean that God's inside every one of us? I don't think Lewis is going to conclude that. I think he, what he's trying to say here is God is the cause of us having reason. Maybe on the Christian view you could say God is in all of us if the Holy Spirit is in all of us or something. Or if you take more of an Eastern view, uh, you might think that you are like a part of God. Right? Right? Take Hinduism, for example. All that exists is basically a part of the one. Brahma, which has split itself into all that exists. But that's a very different kind of view than Western religion. Is this a crazy view? Well, he's saying this for a reason. He's not just pulling it out of his butt. Okay. Anybody else? He thinks that if you take the other view, reason, knowledge, it all falls apart. Why? Well, again, let's take the view that the contemporary scientific view is right. Lewis is going to say that seems to imply your knowledge, your beliefs, your thoughts, what are they? Electrical impulses, chemical reactions that you're just determined to have. And if that is what you are, is that, if that is how your brain works, how can you think you know anything? How can you think you hold any position reasonably? 
unless you take reason itself as somehow justifiable, free, yeah, it's a, it's a weird view, right? Okay, I'll continue on just a little bit more here. Some people may here raise the following question. If reason is sometimes present in my mind and sometimes not, then instead of saying that I am a product of eternal reason, would it not be wiser to say simply that eternal reason itself occasionally works through my organism, leaving me a merely natural being? A wire does not become something other than a wire because an electric current has passed through it. But to talk thus is, in my opinion, to forget what reasoning is like. It is not an object which knocks against us, nor even a sensation which we feel. Reasoning doesn't happen to us. We do it. Every train of thought is accompanied by what Kant called the I think. The traditional doctrine that I am a creature to whom God has given reason, but who is distinct from God, seems to me much more philosophical than the theory that what appears to be my thinking is only God's thinking working through me. On the latter view, it is very difficult to explain what happens when I think correctly but reach a false conclusion, because I have been misinformed about the facts. Why God, who presumably knows the real facts, should be at the pains to think one of his perfectly rational thoughts through a mind in which it is bound to produce error, I do not understand. Nor indeed do I understand why, if all my valid thinking is really God's, he should either make himself mistake it for mine or cause me to mistake it for mine. It seems much more likely that human thought is not God's, but God kindled. So, to just recap the argument one more time. We come to believe in our views about the world on, our, on the basis of reason. right? That's how we conclude how the world works, what happens, why it is the way that it is. So, when we're going to try to figure out how the world works, without leading ourselves to the conclusion that knowledge or reasoning is impossible or doesn't really happen, we have to presume that reasoning is somehow valid in itself. It's not just produced by chemical reactions. And he's going to say, well, what could provide this basis for thinking that we have reason, that we can use it, that it can actually lead us to a correct view of the world? And he's going to say, well, the likely explanation is because there is a God who made you in such a such a way that you could come to know how reality works in some way. He doesn't think any other explanation can account for reason or knowledge, or freedom to choose, or anything. So is it he reasoning that reason is knowledge? Yeah. Yeah. So th that's the puzzle, right? Like, when we're trying to figure out what's going on, we use reason. So then the question is, what would have to be true for our reasoning to make sense, for it to get at the truth? He doesn't find the naturalist picture sensical at all. He thinks it undermines itself. Because if it was true, it wouldn't seem like we could know it was true or reason that it was true. We would just be determined to have the thoughts that we have. And he's like, that's not what reasoning is. Reasoning is something that we do that is... A free activity in some sense. Yeah. It's weird, right? Have you ever heard somebody try to argue for the existence of God in this way?
It's an interesting argument. OK, would somebody continue on there with I must hasten? Oliver, are you there? Which, uh, where do you leave off? We're on page, what is that, right before 38? Hasten? Yeah, I must hasten. Yeah. Christian documents gave a casual and unemphatic accent to the belief that a supernatural part of man survives the death of the natural organism. But they are very little interested in the matter. What they are intensely interested in is the restoration or resurrection of the whole composite creature by a miraculous divine act. And until we have to come to some conclusion about miracles in general, we shall certainly not discuss that. At this stage, the supernatural element in man concerns us solely as evidence that something beyond nature exists. The dignity and destiny of man have, at present, nothing to do with the argument. We are interested in man only because his rationality is the little telltale rift in nature which shows that there is nothing, that there is something beyond or behind there. Okay, keep going. But upon whose surface has completely covered with scum and floating vegetation, there might be few water lilies. And you might, of course, be interested in them for their beauty. But you might also be interested in them because from their structure, you could deduce that they have stalks underneath which went down and roots to the bottom. The naturalist thinks that the pond, nature, the great event in space and time, is of an infinite depth that there is nothing but water forever, how far you go down. My claim is that some of the things on the surface, i.e. in our experience, show the contrary. These things, rational minds, reveal on inspection that they at least are not floating but attached by stalks to the bottom. Therefore, the pond has a bottom. It's not a pond, it's a pond forever. Go deep enough and you will find it, and you will come to something that is not a pond to mud and earth, and then to rock, and finally the whole bulk of the earth in a subterranean fire. At this point, it is tempting to try whether naturalism cannot still be saved. I pointed out in chapter 2 that one could remain a naturalist and yet believe in a certain kind of God, a cosmic consciousness to which the whole show somehow gave rise, what we might call an emergent God. Would not an emergent God give us all we need? Is it really necessary to bring in a supernatural God distinct from and outside of the whole interlocked system? Notice, modern reader, how your spirits rise. How much more at home you would feel with an emergent rather than a transcendent God. How much less primitive, repugnant, and naif the emergent conception seems to you. For by that, as you will see later, there hangs a tale. But I am afraid it will not do. It is, of course, possible to suppose that when all the atoms of the universe got into a certain relation, which they were bound to get into sooner or later, they would give rise to a universal consciousness. And it might have thoughts. And it might cause those thoughts to pass through our minds. But unfortunately, its own thoughts on this supposition would be the product of irrational causes. And therefore, by the rule which we use daily, they would have no validity. This cosmic mind would be, just as much as our own minds, the product of mindless nature, according to the naturalist view. We have not escaped from the difficulty. We have only put it a stage further back. The cosmic mind will help us only if we put it at the beginning. If we suppose it to be not the product of the whole system, but the basic, original, self-existent fact which exists in its own right. But to admit that sort of cosmic mind is to admit a God outside nature, a transcendent and supernatural God. This route, which looked like offering an escape, really leads us round again to the place we started from. 
So why doesn't this cosmic mind idea work? Maybe there is a universal consciousness that emerged from how everything is placed and related and the atoms got together. And How come that doesn't work, according to him? Yes? Right. So again, he made this distinction between cause and effect and ground and consequent. Right? He asks us, how, what do arrangements of matter have anything to do with logical relations? What do they have to do with each other? If I get the, the right arrangement of matter, can I produce a, a valid thought, a valid argument in someone's head? He's like, no, those things have no, nothing to do with each other. Again, we said, if somebody is caused to have an, a belief or a thought by physical causes, natural causes, we think it undermines its validity, undermines its justifiability. So he doesn't think this new agey cosmic consciousness can solve our problem for us. He thinks instead we need to turn to a more ancient view. And so he says, there is then a God who is not a part of nature, but nothing has yet been said to show that he must have created her. Might God and nature be both self-existent and totally independent of each other? If you thought they were, you would be a dualist and would hold a view which I consider manlier and more reasonable than any form of naturalism. You might be many worse things than a dualist, but I do not think dualism is true. That is, this idea that there are two independent eternal things or substances. There is an enormous difficulty in conceiving two things which simply coexist and have no other relation. If this difficulty sometimes escapes our notice, that is because we are the victims of picture thinking. We really imagine them side by side in some kind of space. But of course, if they were both in a common space, or a common time, or in any kind of common medium, whatever, they would both be parts of a system, in fact, of a nature. Even if we succeed in eliminating such pictures, the mere fact of our trying to think of them together slurs over the real difficulty because, for that moment anyway, our own mind is the common medium. If there can be such a thing as sheer otherness, if things can coexist and no more, it is at any rate a conception which my mind cannot form. And in the present instance, it seems specially gratuitous to try to form it. For we already know that God and nature have come into a certain relation. They have, at the very least, a relation, almost in one sense, a common frontier in every human mind. So, he asks the question here, well, okay, so maybe we will admit there is a God. But why can't we think that these two things are totally separate? They're not related. They don't causally interact and have nothing to do with each other. He says we cannot even conceive of that. Why? Well, if we try to conceive of that, that would seem to imply that they are not sheer other to each other. If we can compare them at all, or picture them together at all, there is some relation or connection between them. So a weird argument, but he doesn't think that we have any reason to believe that if a god does exist, it has no connection at all to this, because we can't even rationally conceive of that in our own minds. So we don't have reason to believe it. Okay, will somebody pick up again the relations which arise? I'll just 
was calling one of you. Go back to the grade school days. Thank you. Yeah, just an old-fashioned way of spelling that word. <laughs> Which unifies and develops. Our whole picture of nature being invaded was wrong. When we actually examine one of these invasions, it looks more like, much more like the arrival of a king among, among his own subjects or a Moloch yeah. <laughs> visiting his own elephant. The elephant may run amok. Nature may be rebellious, but from observing what happens when nature obeys, it is almost impossible not to conclude that it is of her very nature to be a subject. All happens as if she had been designed for that very role. Good, good. Okay, so what is, yeah, what picture is he presenting us with here? What is the relation between reason and nature, broadly speaking? How are they related to one another? Yes, yeah. He saying that like when reason and nature come together, it's not like a fight or a war like he wants about with a spearhead, but it's a beam of light that illuminates it and they can kind of work together. Yeah, he Im <laughs> he implies it's like, and he even says here, it's as if nature has been designed to be ruled by reason. What do you think about that? Is that the way nature appears to you? If you think about your own personal experience, how you think, what goes right and wrong in your life, when you give yourself over to all your natural urges and instincts and desires and don't subject your will to reason, what happens? You drink a fifth of vodka and get blackout drunk? Or you buy 12 vapes because you found a good deal online and then you use them all up in a week? Your health suffers? <laughs> Your mental health suffers? Yeah? Yeah, it's very... The, the picture he's presenting to us is very interesting. Nature seems to rebel against the rule of reason, but it's like they fit together in a strange way. If reason rules nature, things go right and good. Does that seem right to you? Or is he just uh, being a weirdo? Tell me your thoughts on this. I promise you they won't be stupid. I just want to hear what you all think.
Nevelyn, what do you think? Oh, uh, what I had was like the intersection of reason and nature was human consciousness. Yeah. Because you, like these youth animals, they you would say they don't have as much reason as like humans, for example. I think a lot of people would agree. Would you all agree with that? Animals don't have reason like we do. Okay. Yeah. So say more. Um. Reason and nature are not totally separate. Yeah. And then I guess maybe the human's reason does govern nature, but then I think maybe it's not widely applicable. Hmm. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look at all the things that we've been able to do on account of reason. We can make tables. We can make laptops. We can improve human life. We can build rockets. If we had never employed reason, we would never be able to do any of those things, right? What he's presenting here is what you might call a very platonic view of the human being. In his book, The Republic, Plato argues that if you can get people to live their lives according to reason, if you can get people to subject their appetites, their desires, their impulses to reason, you can make human life better for people and build a good, happy society. And so in his philosophy, education is critical to get people to get along, for society to function, to get people to be happy and become better versions of themselves. Lewis is saying a similar thing here. And he's even going further. He's saying, not only is it good when reason rules nature, reason is meant to rule nature. An interesting view. Okay, I'll just finish this up. To believe that nature produced God or even the human mind, is, as we have seen, absurd. To believe that the two are both independently self-existent is impossible. At least, the attempt to do so leaves me unable to say that I am thinking of anything at all. It is true that dualism has a certain theological attraction. It seems to make the problem of evil easier. But if we cannot, in fact, think dualism out to the end... This attractive promise can never be kept. And I think there are better solutions to the problem of evil. There remains then the belief that God created nature. This at once supplies a relation between them and gets rid of the difficulty of sheer otherness. That was introduced by dualism. This also fits in with the observed frontier situation in which everything looks as if nature were not resisting an alien invader, but rebelling against a lawful sovereign. This, and perhaps this alone, fits in with the fact that nature, though not apparently intelligent, is intelligible. That events in the remotest parts of space appear to obey the laws of rational thought. Even the act of creation itself presents none of the intolerable difficulties which seem to meet us on every other hypothesis. There is, in our own human minds, something that bears a faint resemblance to it. We can imagine, that is, we can cause to exist the mental pictures of material objects and even human characters and events. We fall short of creation in two ways. In the first place, we can only recombine elements borrowed from the real universe, but no one can imagine a new primary color or a sixth sense. This is something Descartes said, right? To provide support for the idea that he wasn't just making up what he saw, because he was like, I had to get these ideas from somewhere, right? In the second place, what we imagine exists only for our own consciousness, though we can, by words, induce other people to build for themselves 
pictures in their own minds, which may be roughly similar to it. We should have to attribute to God the power both of producing the basic elements, of inventing not only the colors, but color itself, the senses themselves, space-time, and matter themselves, and also of imposing what he has invented on created minds. This seems to be, to me, no intolerable assumption. It is certainly easier than the idea of God and nature as wholly unrelated, and far easier than the idea of nature producing valid thought. I do not maintain that God's creation of nature can be proved as rigorously as God of God as God's existence. But it seems to me overwhelmingly probable, so probable that no one who approached the question with an open mind would very seriously entertain any other hypothesis. In fact, one seldom meets people who have grasped the existence of a supernatural God and yet deny that he is the creator. All the evidence we have points in that direction, that if God exists, he created it all. And difficulties spring up on every side if we try to believe otherwise. No philosophical theory, which I have yet come across, is a radical improvement on the words of Genesis. That in the beginning, God made heaven and earth. I say radical improvement because the story in Genesis as St. Jerome said long ago, is told in the manner of a popular poet, or as we should say, in the form of folktale. But if you compare it with the creation legends of other peoples, with all these delightful absurdities in which giants to be cut up and floods to be dried up are made to exist before creation, the depth and originality of this Hebrew folktale will soon be apparent. The idea of creation in the rigorous sense of the word is there fully grasped. So, let me just summarize a little bit of some of those points he made at the end. What do we notice about the world around us? And about ourselves? Here's what we notice. We seem to have this thing called reason. We seem to be able to figure out how the world works in some ways, right? We have these thing called, things called senses. We have the ability to manipulate the world around us. If we allow reason to govern, better things happen than if we allow nature to govern. Nature seems to work according to certain rules and principles, right? There seem to be certain laws baked into it. And it would seem nature is intelligible to us. Lewis thinks when you add all this up, it provides a lot of support for the idea that we were created by a supernatural being, and so was this universe. Because you might wonder, for example, if all of this was just a cosmic accident, is it very likely that life would have emerged at all? Is it likely that there would be certain rules and principles that govern natural processes? Is it likely that nature would be intelligible at all for intelligent life to understand it? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. But he thinks it's pointing in the direction of a creator God. So what do you all think of that? He hasn't provided a proof. I don't think he thinks he can prove it. But What do you think of these arguments, these musings?
Nothing at all? Come on, some of you must be like, hell yeah, Lewis, and some other of you must be like, what the hell are you talking about? You're an idiot. Tell me. <laughs> Anybody think he's an idiot? I'll raise my hand. He's an idiot. What arguments could we provide to show that he's wrong? This is logic and argument. Yeah? Just because we don't know how life started doesn't mean that there's a God. Like somebody else could have started it. Right. Right, yeah. If we assume that God created everything just because we don't know how we got here, that would be a fallacy, right? Okay, yeah, so we don't know exactly how we got here, but that doesn't mean that there's necessarily a God. Yeah. Okay, what else? Yeah. Okay. That's technically wrong to say that you can't trace that back to when it's not. Okay. Okay. I think I'm following what you're saying. What do the rest of you all think? Do you think he is making sense? Or do you think this is nonsense? You don't think we could prove it either way? Kant thought that we wouldn't be able to prove if free will existed or did not exist. Maybe God is like that. It certainly seems like we have free will, but based on biology and chemistry, it seems like we don't. But if we don't have free will, then we don't have any choice in believing that we do or don't. And all these institutions and practices, reward and punishment and jailing, seem to depend on the belief that people have free will. And maybe we can't know. I don't know. Okay, well, since y'all are dead, we're just going to finish up by reading a little bit more, and then we'll end class. Let's just look at chapter 5. Some people regard logical thinking as the deadest and driest of our activities, and may therefore be repelled by the privileged position I gave it in the last chapter. But logical thinking, reasoning, had to be the pivot of the argument, because all the claims which the human mind puts forward the claim of reasoning to be valid is the only one which the naturalist cannot deny, philosophically speaking, without cutting his own throat. You cannot, as we saw, prove that there are no proofs. But you can, if you wish, regard all human ideals as illusions and all human loves as biological byproducts. That is, you can do so without running into flat self-contradiction and nonsense. Whether you can do so without extreme unplausibility, without accepting a picture of things which no one really believes, is another matter. Besides reasoning about matters of fact, men also make moral judgments. I ought to do this. I ought not to do that. This is good. This is evil. Two views have been held about moral judgments. Some people think that when we make them, we are not using our reason, but are employing some different power. Other people think that we make them by our reason. I myself hold this second view. That is, I believe that the primary moral principles on which all others depend are rationally perceived. This is something that Kant held as well. 
we just see that there is no reason why my neighbor's happiness should be sacrificed to my own, as we just see that things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another. If we cannot prove either axiom, that is not because they are irrational, but because they are self-evident, and all proofs depend on them. Their intrinsic reasonableness shines by its own light. It is because all morality is based on such self-evident principles that we say to a man, when we would recall him to right conduct, be reasonable. But this is, by the way, for our present purpose, it doesn't matter which of these two views you adopt. The important point is to notice that moral judgments raise the same sort of difficulty for naturalism as other thoughts. We always assume in discussions about morality, as in all other discussions, that the other man's views are worthless if they can be fully accounted for by some non-moral and non-rational cause. When two men differ about good and evil, we soon hear this principle being brought into play. He believes in the sanctity of property because he's a millionaire. He believes in pacifism because he's a coward. He approves of corporal punishment, or capital punishment, because he's a sadist. Such taunts may often be untrue, but the mere fact that they are made by the one side and hotly rebutted by the other shows clearly what principle is being used. Neither side doubts that if they were true, they would be decisive. No one pays any attention to any moral judgment which it can be shown to spring from non-moral and non-rational causes. The Freudian and Marxists attack traditional morality precisely on this ground and with wide success. All men accept the principle. What he's going to get into now, and which is something I'd like you to research for our next discussion, is the is-ought distinction. So we don't have class on Tuesday, right? But we do on Thursday? Correct. So look this up before you all come back to class. David Hume is-ought distinction. David Hume once argued the following. You cannot derive an ought from an is. What naturalism purports to do is explain what is. But if we're going to believe that there is an objective standard of right and wrong, no account of what is can explain that. So where do we get this objective standard from? How could it exist? Does it exist at all? That's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you have a good weekend. I will see you in a week, I suppose.